Ah, é. sim. Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome once again to Rikwinga Foundation. I will speak in English because our distinguished speaker and guest will speak in English also. Uh, so I just take you a couple of minutes uh, to thank you all for joining us here um, in presence to, to join to this conference, the first talk of 2023 of Dokomomo Macau. Um, I want to thank also to all who join us through Facebook. Uh, we are live on Facebook uh, through the pages of the Foundation and also to Docomomo Facebook page. I also want to thank to Rui Leão, Arquiteto Rui Leão, Chair of Docomomo Macau. He will, he's our co-host, Docomomo is our co-host tonight, and Rui is our moderator for tonight. So, thank you all for being here. We will have more conference, more talks like this during the year. So, stay tuned for the, our upcoming events. Uh, for now, I hope you enjoy uh, the session of tonight. I want to thank you, Professor, Professor Comas, to accepting our invitation. It's an honor to have you here in the Foundation and also a privilege to listen and to attend to your lecture tonight. I think it's all. The floor is yours. Thank you, Filipe, and uh, thank you all uh, for uh, being here with us uh, in this session. Uh, it is uh, uh, sp uh, with special emotion that we 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 make uh, uh, our first uh, event with a with a foreign speaker, a speaker who is not based in Macau and who is not on the Zoom, coming out of the Zoom screen. Uh, I have to say that I was a little bit uh, depressed and fed up with this three years of of uh, this game. And so the moment that I found out that Professor Comas was uh, giving some uh, uh, teaching uh, teaching in Tongji University and was coming to south south of China, uh, I, I asked him to come here because uh, I, I imagine that all of you as me are uh, thinking uh, this is the, the thing that we uh, we refreshment that uh, that we we miss. So uh, thank you, uh, welcome very much to to Macau and to to Fundação uh, Ricunha. Uh, I, I want to 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 present uh, 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 Professor Carlos Eduardo Comas, uh, whom uh, is a very distinguished uh, uh, researcher and professor in the field of uh, uh, modernist architecture and uh, history of architecture. Uh, Professor Comas uh, graduated as an architect on the uh, Universidade Federal de Rio Grande do Sul, has a master in urban planning and architecture from the uh, University of Pennsylvania, and a PhD in project architecture and urban form in the University of Paris 8. He is Professor Emeritus at UFRGS, uh, Rio Grande do Sul, and a visiting professor at uh, Tongji University. Um, he uh, is also uh, has a lot of uh, uh, assignments on uh, the field of uh, research, architectural research, in, uh, and is uh, in, in, in uh, Propar in UFRGS in the, in the area of theory and history and criticism of architecture, and uh, uh, several other uh, um, work uh, developed. Uh, in the Rio Grande do Sul uh, nucleus of Docomomo. is a past uh, chair of Docomomo Brazil, the uh, national uh, Docomomo of Brazil, and uh, was also the curator of the MoMA exhibition on uh, South America. He's currently a uh, visiting professor in Shanghai and also in, uh, um, uh, in Brazil, uh, where he will uh, where he is based. And uh, with, uh, with this, uh, I pass uh, uh, the floor to Professor Comas. Uh, he will be conducting his lecture from, uh, from uh, uh, a technical chair there on the back so that he is more comfortable uh, to review. But as Professor Comas uh, said, 
uh, the important thing is that uh, we look at the images and hear his voice. And then by the end of the session, we'll come back here to the stage for the Q&A. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Fundação Rui Cunha. Thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Mama Macau for this invitation. Uh, I'm very touched, you know, by being in Macau. This is my first time in Macau. And uh, amazing, amazing, really, you know. I just had a few uh, hours. But uh, it, uh, my, my portion of Portuguese blood, you know, is really... <sighs> okay, uh, as uh, Rui said, um, this is going to be more or less uh, not unlike uh, a virtual presentation, because actually the presentation is in the form of uh, a slideshow. I have lots of slides. It's, uh, it's really, you know, images with legends. And so uh, I have to be very careful and I have to edit very concisely what I have to say so I can improvise. So I'll ask you uh, the permission you know, to go backstage and conduct the show from there. And then afterwards, I'll come back and uh, we can have uh, some questions Please. and answers. Okay? Thank you. Uh, I just need my glasses. If I don't have. Yes. I'm nervous. <laughs> okay. Uh, national pavilions uh, in international exhibitions have a dual condition. They are uh, marquees, temporary but often lavish shelters and uh, emblems of their countries. The Brazilian pavilion at Dubai is the fourth of a series of designs by young architects deemed world-class talents. All but the Brussels design were chosen by public competition. The architects of New York and Brussels were based in Rio. Those of Osaka and Dubai were based in Sao Paulo. Three of the involved generations had the Bazaar's education. The modernization of the architectural curriculum in Brazil dates from the early 1950s. Uh, three of the involved, uh, okay, I already said that. You know, so that's. Uh, all architects endorsed a definition of architecture formulated by Costa. Architecture is construction intending to organize space plastically in function of a given age, milieu, technique, program. Conscious attention informs erudite architecture. Unconscious attention informs vernacular architecture. Costa followed etymology. All architecture is building, but not every building is architecture. A national pavilion is both a shelter for exhibitions and an exhibition piece itself, representing and celebrating the country behind it. In other words, it is a monument, created to recall and commemorate an individual institution, idea, event, a machine for remembrance, therefore a memorable landmark. Not every shelter is a monument, but a monument can also shelter. Theoretician Marc Antoine Logier thought that architecture descended from a primitive heart. A century later, another Frenchman, Catherine de Cancy, recognized three archetypes for architecture, although insisting on the superiority of the Greek hut, the farmer's cabin that was synonymous of balance and harmony, over the light Chinese tent, the shepherd's dwelling that was synonymous of transience, transience and the solid Egyptian cave, the hunter's abode that was synonymous of force. The expressive difference between the classical orders paralleled those between the cave, the tent, and the hut. And if memorability is of the essence for monuments, 
Durability is relative. Monuments are not necessarily everlasting, huge, and civic. They can be ephemeral, private, and small. They need not be epic or grandiloquent. They can be lyrical, even casual. Chinese rather than Greek, Ionian rather than Doric. Heaviness can be demolished any time. Lightness can be meant to stay, as shown by the huge conservatory where the first international exhibition took place in 1851. No pavilions there, but many stalls in a crystal palace, a mega structure ahead of the time. An ephemeral monument is not an oxymoron, and an ephemeral looking monument is not an oddity. Chinese may be preferred to Greek as a starting point for architecture itself. Indeed, Costa, Niemeyer, Bernardes, and Mendes da Rocha defended the formal system that valued the lightness of the skeletal frame over the massiveness of load-bearing masonry. Anticipated in 1915, born around 1922, christened modern in 1928. It was not the only architecture of the interwar period claiming to be modern in the sense of a contemporary. Art Deco and stripped-down classicism were among its competitors. But it pretended to be the true, a truer expression of modernity understood as the machine age. While competitors still saw architecture as a plump matron, the progressist Costa compared it to a smart girl with spindly legs and no makeup. Modern architecture got a nickname in 1932, became hegemonic but not monolithic after World War II, suffered a crisis in the 1956 Siam, and died in 1972, supposedly, two years after Osaka, superseded by postmodern architecture, then by contemporary architecture. Whether this exact is open to debate, which the Brazilian pavilion at Dubai might help to settle. Before visiting it, informed by its three predecessors, Note that national pavilions counted among the interwar successes of the Siam brand modern architecture. Melnikov's pavilion featured a diagonal staircase running up and then down between trapezoidal prisms truncated by sloping roofs and extensively glazed. Inside and outside interpenetrated along with public and private space. Surfaces were planar, the structural grid clearly on view. The reduction of the elements of architecture to a primary geometry was absolute. In the flat-roofed Barcelona pavilion, a labyrinth that paraded the free plan made possible by the autonomy of support and enclosure. Cantilevers assured a free facade. The luxurious materiality provided organic instead of reprehensible applied ornament. In this 1937 pavilion, inside and outside interpenetrated through a void between two solids, exposing the pilotee as free and engaged columns, respectively. No cantilevers meant that the free facade or the flat roof was preferential rather than imperative. The external stair hinted at an elaborate choreography of movement in the premise. In the same exhibition, Alto introduced curves and warm wooden surfaces. Curves also showed in the design that paraphrased Melnikov, replacing stairs with ramps. For pillows in steel made up the roof with two supports per facade. 
if Le Corbusier's output of the 1920s can be labeled purist, that of the 1930s should be called meta-purist, as it tries to overcome the white box formula. Costa and Niemeyer had plenty of material to consider, among which their own projects. In 1936, Costa led two design teams that included Niemeyer. Their design for the University of Brazil campus to the left was rejected, that for the Ministry of Education was in construction. The site was one-third of a block shared with the French pavilion. The lot had three frontages, to Rainbow Avenue, one of the main entrances to the fair, to a curving street, and to the Canal Avenue, a pedestrian uh, alley separated it from uh, its neighbor. The curve became a light motif, lending union grace and elegance, Costa's words, to the pavilion in contrast with the Doric severity of the ministry, which also portrayed the country, but in a whole serious mood appropriate for a permanent monument. An open, lacy composition also contrasted with the neighbor's massiveness. To store it and all shape it, the composition featured a curving slab housing the main gallery aligned with the street and a rectangular terrace parallel to Rainbow Avenue. Between the gallery and the auditorium atop the terrace, the portico was accessible by a curving ramp starting from the corner of Street and Rainbow Avenue. Outbuildings turned the L shape into a distorted H. Voids created routes between the restaurant, the coffee bar, the information booth, a panel comparing Brazilian with American data beside the curving ramp and the services. The relaxed ground floor offered a veranda-like open exhibition space, joined to the more formal upper floor by stairs that paired with the ramp. The sequence of four coat, veranda, and garden expanded into the Canal Avenue and the fields beyond pausing at the pond of a meboid contours filled with Amazonian water lilies. From the street in Rainbow Avenue, the pavilion was horizontally stratified. At the Piano Nobile, the blank and levered gallery adjoined the perforated screen shielding the administration. The edges of the terrace, the expansion of the gallery's flat roof, and the service wall created a virtual frame for the auditorium. The porous base alternated voids and curved screens that sometimes hid and sometimes highlighted supports. From the Canal Avenue, the pavilion became a crystal palace behind colossal columns, tenuously united by the expansion of the flat roof to the auditorium. The theatrical opposition between front and rear views is not misplaced in an affair. The public reached the garden as if coming from the backstage. The transparent, the transparent gallery and wall explained the trick achieved by displacing the enclosure, the enclosed volume, and the structural cage. At the terrace, the blank inclined wall of the auditorium redirected the movement from the ramp towards the glazed entrance of the gallery. The curving cantilevered roof expansion embraced the bullet-like tip of the auditorium. The steel construction was given the plasticity of reinforced concrete. The whole of the gallery was a welcome pose, a quiet space defined by the flat surfaces of floor and ceiling. Freestanding H section supports were clad in metal sheet with a butterfly or scroll-like section may be another manifestation of the union spirit. 
wood paneled walls, backdropped flags of the Brazilian states. A curtain opened and the spatial excitement returned. An amoeboid, pro like mezzanine, defined three and then two aisles. Models of ports were on display. The low ceilinged areas downstairs and upstairs stimulated concentration on the displayed objects, while the tall ace alongside the glazed garden facade encouraged movement through the swaying edges of the mezzanine, now intersecting supports, now indented behind supports, figuring an internal colossal order. The autonomy of supports, floors, and walls was reiterated dramatically. The route was a loop, and the visitors returned to the hall and uh, decompressed, looking at specially commissioned paintings that depicted Brazilian scenes. Before re-entering, the terrace and going down by the stairs to enjoy the garden or the exhibition in the veranda-like uh, space. Uh, the coffee bar at the corner had indirect lighting using a cloud-like flat dropped ceiling. Curves reappear at the restaurant bar and the expressionist abstract mural behind its counter as well as in the dinner dance restaurant. Whose doors opened to the lily pond of contours that uh, also swayed. Water was also a presence in Bernardes Pavilion for the Brazilian Steel Company, combining tent and bridge at the 1954 National Exhibition in Sao Paulo. The Brazilian Foreign Office commissioned him to design the Brussels Pavilion uh, on account of that performance. The site was an irregular, sloping one frontage lot with a downhill access similar in area to that in New York. Partially shadowed by uh, the Mexican Pavilion across the curving street. Bernardes turned to the Marquis, the circus, and the free form, actually a bell shape. The composition had three elements. The roof and its supports formed the crowning volume rising from the um, uppermost level. A concrete sheet covered the steel structure. A mesh of cables hung from four curved trusses supported by four corner pylons and slender peripheral columns. The base followed the lot lines and added exhibition space, the auditorium, and an exit ramp which developed under a flat roof slab level with, uh, under a fl flat roof slab level with the entrance hall. The pylons and columns also integrated the elongated body of the building. Columns were free standing in front of a quarter circle wall with clerestory strip windows. Clearly non structural, the wall hinted at the circus inside, while its setback defined a rampant porch. Elsewhere, columns merged with a curtain wall that followed the roof projection. Crowning and body interpenetrated, and so did body and base. A statue graced this entrance porch, brought in to echo the statue at the Mexican neighbor, and recall the connection between Brazilian modern architecture and the nation's colonial past. The circus and the roof and the roof structure were independent. The curtain wall was U-shaped. Isolated panels screened the entrance porch. No base showed at the rear facade. The New York 
Pavilion was developed around the hut theme. Bernard's opted for a canopy or embryonic tent, partially a in a cave. The one-way helicoidal route, cum exhibition space, followed topography may be echoing the Frank Lloyd Wright's Guggenheim Museum, then in construction. The Burlemark's garden in the bottom of the circus central void surrounded an oval pool. The hole in the roof was a modern take on a Roman compluvium. The balloon recalled a popular movie at the time and the spheres in the Expo's trademark. The balloon rose and fell, closing the hole according to the weather. Among the exhibit items, pride of place for the newly inaugurated Presidential Palace of the Dawn in Brasilia by Niemeyer. You have the Atomium, which is the first trademark at the right. And like the New York Pavilion, the Brussels Pavilion was an additive composition, although even more curvilinear, rather intricate and much less open, attractive, but not as fully rounded. The roof structure was also capital in the Paulistano estate that launched Mendes da Rocha career in 1957. Brazil had a 50 by 80 meters lot in Osaka. The front, the front faced the avenue leading to the peripheral monorail line. The rear faced the avenue leading to the exposed central spine and the terminal in the elevated moving walkway system. The Soviet and the North American pavilions stood at opposite corners of a rotated square. To the left, Hawaii separated Brazil from the Soviet pavilion. To the right, the neighbor was Czechoslovakia. Mendes da Rocha proposed a 30 by 50 meters pergola covering the, lof, the lot's central band. Two pre-stressed concrete beams rested on four irregularly spaced columns. They anchored transversal two-meter-high beams, two meter apart, stiffened by two longitudinal beams of the same height. Truncated pyramids, truncated pyramids uh, formed coffers between beams topped by skylight. The extremities featured an interrupted strip of glazing and inclined profiles for the end beams alongside the strip. The arcuated bottom of the pre-stressed beams suggested a bridge structure despite the exaggerated candelabers at either end. The skylights created a moving pattern of light and shadow Truly a, a starry ground, as the architect claimed. Three columns were hidden in man-made hills. The fourth was created with two intersecting porticos, each featuring a round arch. The persistent brings evoked three lifts. This column outlined a virtual dome. The surrounding area was named Coffee Square. The beams rested on rubber articulations. Their segmental arches were mirrored by the undulations, undulations of the artificial topography, covered in asphalt and extending to the sidewalks. Earth for the hills came from excavations for the Brazilian Foreign Office Annex and a multi-purpose hall, used as an auditorium or as a gallery for temporary exhibitions. The hall standed under the roof's projection below the hills at the front, accessed by diagonal ramps at either side of the hill across Coffee Square. The annex ran alongside half of the rear frontage accessed by a ramp alongside the lot line, 
with Hawaii. The sole surviving plan of the proposed permanent exhibition shows sinuous screens between the two pairs between the two pairs of columns roughly parallel to the frontage, adding another curve to counterpoint the regularity of the pergola. Both sinuosity and obliquity entered the scene. At the exit, there was a cluster of flags. The whole uh, okay, sorry. The hall extended under the roof's projection below the hills at the front. I, I guess I already went to this. Yeah. The so, yeah, okay. Sorry, I made a mistake. Okay. Large scales, uh, that's the, uh, uh, the proposal. Uh, large scale reproductions of famous paintings would tell the story of Brazil from the Portuguese landing and settlement to contemporary urban plans. Yeah. Like Costas, pilot plan for Brasilia, Osaka was a cut and fill operation. The foreign office annex was illuminated by the reflection of sunlight in an inclined retaining wall. The manipulation of topography allowed its users a view of Coffee Square. The multipurpose, the multipurpose hall had a taller midsection with a curving tent-like ceiling. Photos show the shaping of the man-made topography. A giant pergola over rolling hills, one of the ramps leading to the hall, and an instance of heavy lightness, the waffle slab that seemed to levitate. The neighbors did not pay attention to the architect's claim of lateral continuity, as confirmed by another photo. You have the monorail at uh, the rear. Stairs replaced uh, ramps at the hall in the construction. The meeting room at the annex received Japanese look in concrete furniture. The inclined retaining wall allowed for diffuse lighting. The Osaka Pavilion is a camouflaged native composition. Uh, crowds lined in front of the completed pavilion. Upper left is going from Czechoslovakia to Brazil by the entrance frontage. Bottom right is the pavilion about to open. A conventional permanent exhibition replaced the original proposal, deemed too high bro. Painted asphalt and super graphics done with green and yellow. Green and yellow felt strips look at cheap and unsympathetic, if modish. But the ways of entering the pavilion were not altered. On level to the left at uh, the highway border, up and down the earth-covered roof of the multipurpose hall at the central void between the two hills, and last, down and up the stairs to the hall at the right. All focus on the coffee square and its exotic column. Obliquity, curves, and straight lines interplay. Panels were located perpendicular to the avenue as a succession of discontinuous elements. When the pavilion was empty, they looked like human-sized cardboard figures, disfiguring the architecture. There was no water in Osaka, just wave lines describing a fisheye and wave surfaces evocative of the hilly plateau on which Sao Paulo was founded to remind visitors that architecture and landscape architecture work together both by contrast and similarity. But water is the crowning glory of the sesque 
24 of May Leisure Center, a project that Mendes da Rocha developed with MMBB, one of the architects of the Dubai Pavilion. Below the rooftop pool, the whole floor is a veranda for lounging, bordered by a shallow strip of water in which people dip their feet to relax and with which kids play. For Dubai, the former collaborators of Mendes da Rocha blew up the veranda and enclosed a liquid-covered plaza. The Brazilian pavilion stood in the sustainability section on a circle sector with two concentric frontages. The small size of the lot recommended a compact design. Volumetric simplicity assured memorability among convoluted neighbors. 44 meters square and 28 meter high, a white cube built with canvas lined metallic trusses that seemed to over centimeters overgrown. Water surrounding it suggested a moat, but a closer look revealed an overflow. There was one discrete support, which will be repeated in the other face of the cube in a rotated square pattern. The trusses was distorted to provide entry, as if the visitor pulled a circus marquee to sneak in. A triangular opening and a dry passage define the entrance. Gaps between the canvas and the trusses emphasize the layering of the facade, pitting soft planarity against hard and graphic linearity, almost ornamental in its rhythm. Inside, a black pool vied for attention with a truncated pyramid upside down, tied like a balloon the square gap reminiscent of a compluvium, again. Many projectors protruded from a box within a box or aligned over the bottom members of the trusses. The gaps between the ceiling and the steel cage allowed hot air to escape already refreshed by the water. The minimalist box within a box stood on piloti consisting of two pairs of peripheral pillars flush with the walls above. The ground floor featured a mostly blank service block between two open aisles. One accommodated the restaurant, the other was a covered walkway, the circulation spine. Another triangular opening that we don't see allowed for the exit aligned with the entrance Visitors could cross the pavilion as a shortcut. The first floor of the box was an observation deck, limited by peripheral trusses. The second sheltered meeting rooms and administration office. Both were air conditioned. The window wall revealed the trusses. The narrow ribbon window reinforced the horizontality of the box. Sunlight was filtered and shadows played. The steel members provided graphic interest. Visitors could cross the pool without getting wet. The low ceiling of the covered walkway introduced spatial compression. The effect was reiterated in the restaurant area extending behind the service block. A third triangular opening allowed for access to outdoor tables. Coffee was no longer emphasized. Another kind of artificial topography, the ground floor included a H-shaped walkway and some curves. The square opening in the ceiling was off-center, as if displaced by the box within a box. The rotated square at the top of the cage provided additional bracing, 
and more of that subtly oriental ornamentation, ornamental flavor. The covered plaza ventilated naturally with satisfactory thermal performance, the balloon, the balloon shape alluded to Brussels. The black pool awaited visitors and they come, they came, they appeared. In droves, the Brazilian pavilion counted among the five more visited buildings in the expo. When the sun set, a magic lantern was turned on and the immersive experience began. No artworks in Dubai, just a specially commissioned state-of-the-art light and sound installation focusing on nature, maybe a bit too conventionally. Exposed beams and installations below floor slabs created a lacy virtual layer with texture and depth, while the V-shaped columns added natural stylization to this spectacle. Well, the four pavilions were erected in different contexts. The New York World's first celebrated the end of the Great Depression and saw the beginning of World War II. Expo 58 was held during the Cold War. Expo 70 preceded the oil crisis, although indictment of the industrial society was already rampant. Delayed by the coronavirus pandemic, Expo 2020 was a child of the digital revolution and concern for the sustainability of the planet. Sion brand modern architecture was a minority affair be before 1945, hegemonic in the West after that, and the object of harsh criticism one decade later. Siam was dissolved in 1956 amidst intergenerational fighting. The 1970s indictment of the industrial society included indictment of modern architecture. Delayed by the coronavirus pandemic, uh, Expo 20 Dubai is a child of the revolution and the renewed concern for the sustainability of the planet. The current architectural scene seems aesthetically plural regarding conscious plastic intention, the very idea of a common formal system being suspect. The New York Brazilian Pavilion was an initiative of the authoritarian Estado Novo. Brussels paralleled uh, to the design and construction of Brasilia by a democratic president, presidency. Osaka happened under a military regime when Brasilia was being demonized by the West. As of Dubai, Brazil was back to democracy. Brazil populations grew, and now 85% of it is urban. Yet, the generic program of the pavilions barely changed, both in symbolic and operational terms. Depict Brazil in the best possible terms, show her contributing decisively for a better world, show her handling modern technologies to earn some respect as a developing rather than underdeveloped nation, but also show her proud of her territorial assets. And culture, because culture sells and tourism is a big industry. Present her characteristic traits identifying a growing individual while pointing out that she is a worthy member of the civilized family project a convincing image, for if a national essence exists, it is ineffable. Last but not least, deliver a well-orchestrated plan 
considering the demands of access and ingress of visitors and staff, exhibition galleries, office, auditorium, and service. Sites and architectural parties varied in the four pavilions. Certain attitudes or interests persisted. Attention to the site and its surroundings underpinned all designs, in all designs, the quest for differentiation. Big spans prevailed whether the structure was reticulated or tensile, in steel or concrete. Deviations of street regularity and living in all structural designs. Enclosure had the same rank as structure in New York and Brussels, disappeared in Osaka, and returned subordinate to structure in Dubai, but their interplay remained a constant. Curvilinear and rectilinear geometries were skillfully handled. The concern with interpenetration of inside and outside led to covered spaces without walls, be they veranda, porch, pergola, or an extreme case without an intermediate threshold, the Dubai Plaza laterally enclosed it, whose enclosure does not touch the ground. Porosity and permeability were recurring traits. Screens for sunlight control were not used after New York as air conditioning became ordinary and cutting-edge electrical lighting is limited to New York and Dubai. But all pavilions explored natural lighting and ventilation. Present in New York, Brussels, and Dubai, water was only implied in Osaka. In all of them, the ground was an active element of composition. Movement was expertly choreographed. Roots lengthened and multiplied to better appreciate the architecture and the body appreciating it. The compositional richness of the pavilions was both the substratum and complement of adroit characterization, the creation of distinctive physiognomies and atmospheres related to program and situation in different levels. As observed, differentiation, differentiation from context is a key ingredient of memorability and thus of monumentality. So is differentiation from ordinary buildings, big spans, gardens, and, art, and artworks are also badges of monumentality. In New York, a work of Metapuri's modern architecture conveyed a progressivist stance consonant with the theme of the World's Fair. In Brussels, the red balloon was an attractive gimmick. In Osaka, building in reinforced concrete was provocative in its contradictoriness. In Dubai, the refusal to do extravagant, iconic architecture conveyed a conservative stance consonant with the sub-theme of the Expo session. In all cases, there, was a, there is a striving for memorable singularity. The openness of the New York and Osaka pavilions helped to differentiate them from art galleries or museums. Near enclosure in Brussels and Dubai had a similar effect. All of them answered with subdued theatricality and great panache to a first peculiar and short-lived mix of entertainment, commerce, and politics. Regarding the expression of nationhood, the architects knew that, as Costa once wrote, Technology knows no frontiers, but local character can be easily achieved by using distinctive plants, facades, materiality, and vegetation. They recognize that the future has many paths to reconsider. Recollection of precedents asserts lineages 
and contributes to the creation of atmospheres. Memorability is facilitated by association with relevant past examples. The architects resorted to archetypes and stereotypes. The tent, the hut, and the cave are foundations. In New York, the Brazilian pavilion emulated the dignified domesticity of a plantation house with a dramatic twist. In Brussels, it was inspired by the playfulness of a circus. In Osaka, it modulated light and shadow, providing the amenity of a pergola in the park on a grander scale, while insinuating a kinship with Japanese metabolism. In Dubai, near the Arabic desert, the shallow pool evoked a beachy seaside location and the joys it can afford. The openness of those pavilions can be understood as a reflection of the openness of the land and its people. But that may be just a hopeful wish. I collect some relevant references and connections, and they will go without much explanation. New York evokes plantation houses, and uh, Le Corbusier's plan for Rio, as well as Le Corbusier's reference to the Georgian Crescent, Union grace and elegance contrast with the Doric severity by the same architects. Brussels passes for a blown up version of Casa Cavanella's from Nimayo. A boat to write. Le Corbusier's drawing of Rio Mountains counterpoint Mendes da Rocha's Osaka. Like Nimayo's, Communist, French Communist Party headquarters in Paris. The Covered Plaza has a Latin American story, starting in Caracas, but also going to Neymar Zibira Park, Park in Sao Paulo. Big roof covering all range of functions can be found in the brutalist work of Villanova Artigas. Roof without walls, cantilevered exhibition buildings, contrasts, minimal number of supports in those museums, but also in the 50 by 50 house project by Mies. The museum also is a covered plaza, and I like the slate and the translucence of the Bernschaft Library. So, I have two concluding remarks. The first is historiographical. Stylistic labels and periodization are outmoded, yet their usefulness has not faded. The Dubai Pavilion is not outside the formal system called modern architecture, understood as a diverse and inclusive, historically grounded tradition. As Costa noted in 1936, two formal conceptions met and complemented each other in modern architecture, one blossoming like a Gothic flower, the other contained like a Greek crystal. Modern architecture was born out of the will to regenerate a discipline lost in historicism and eclecticism. Starting from the skeletal frame, the advanced construction mode that characterized the machine age, it had come to encompass other types of structures. Starting from geometrical abstraction, the advanced art that characterized the machine age, it had come to admit a certain amount of stylized figuration. Allusion to the past replaced its replication. Brazilian modern architecture did not die in 1972. No one would say the work of Mendes da Rocha, since Osaka is postmodern or non-contemporary. Brutalists, like purists, are constellations in the, in the history of modern architecture. 
Metapurist, Beyond Purist, is a good label for the work of Le Corbusier and Brazilians like Niemeyer and Costa from the Ministry of Education to Brasilia. It makes sense to speak of a postmodern condition as the Western cultural context changed substantially since the 1970s. But formal systems can outgrow their context. It also makes sense to speak of a historical or vintage modern architecture associated with industrialization and recognize its mutation, for lack of a better word, into a contemporary modern architecture committed to sustainable, to sustainable development. This modern architecture does not pretend to be vanguardist or even consensual but it wants to contribute to survival through design, not only by producing machines for living or remembrance, but also machines for inspiration, that is, for elevating or stimulating influence upon hearts and minds. One century old, modern architecture is in its adolescence if compared with the classical tradition that prevail in the West from Renaissance to World War II. Like classical architecture, modern architecture has an aesthetics. John Summerson, the British critic, said that in the last instance, there is no classical architecture without the orders. Regarding historical modern architecture, there are easily consulted family albums and genealogical Records, records. Regarding contemporary modern architecture, I content myself with family traits. What you see, what you get, is what you see. Up to a point. My second remark is about aesthetics and qualifies that statement. If aesthetics refers etymologically to what is perceived by the senses, the Brazilian pavilion at Dubai reminds us that architecture does not live from sight alone, integrating the sound of feet hitting the water, as if in Ipanema, the rhythm of bossa nova as played in the restaurant, the feeling of freshness when wet skin is cooled by the current, by the rising, uh, by the current of air that rises, uh, the scent of jasmine and the smell of freshly made coffee. Their predecessors would have told similar stories, but ephemeral monuments turn into documents. Fortunately, Dubai is a recent memory, confirming that contemporary or historical, there is more to Brazilian modern architecture than meets the eye. Does this mean sight is not of the essence for architectural conception and appreciation? No. It just means, first, that it does not work alone. Second, that it engages mind as well as heart, soul as well as body. There is an old modern dream to which the Brazilian pavilion at Dubai also alluded to the marriage of untamed nature and advanced technology. Alas, for eyes that do see, the dream has gone sour for some time. For instance, waterfalls have been flooded to harness hydropower. Marine plastic pollution increased. From one viewpoint, the Brazilian pavilion at Dubai celebrated the human world at its most idyllic. From another, it sounded a cry of alarm, pointing out by inversion that the real human world may perish sooner than later. No reason for commemoration, but for reflection and intelligent action. Arguably, Architecture can also be a machine for thinking and help to prevent a new deluge. Thanks.
that's it. Thank you, <coughs> Professor Edward Kumach, ah. for this uh, analysis of the pavilion, these different moments of uh, architect Brazilian architecture expression to the pavilion. It's very interesting how uh, the um, uh, all of these uh, pavilions in your analysis are um, uh, a critical uh, revisitation of modernism and what that means mm -hmm. in the Brazilian vision of of uh, society progress uh, and uh, political project um, and uh, uh, how uh, uh, Somehow, the, the message that uh, uh, you read through the, of each pavilion, like what you just said about Dubai, that it is uh, 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 looking at, at a vision of the planet, also not a celebration necessarily, a and how all of that is embedded in the, in the, in the pavilion. Yeah, that yeah. is a very interesting analysis mm -hmm. of how uh, the, the expo can be uh, a monument of uh, critical reflection. Um, so, I, I just wanted to say that in summary of your interesting uh, analysis of uh, the pavilions. And I would like to uh, ask if there is any um, question that uh, wants to be uh, one place to Professor Komash. I wonder if uh, we could uh, um, light a room so that... Uh, ah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your fantastic presentation. Okay. Allowed thank us you. to to see and to uh, have access to a lot of documental information, old plans, photos that most of them were not ex easily accessible mm. and reachable to for for others. Uh, and you did a pretty pretty amazing research. My my query uh, has got to do with the, the starting point that you called your presentation about ephemeral monuments, mm. um, and uh, it it seems that lies here a, a basic contradiction, uh, calling ephemeral monuments to to um, to an assumption that uh, I understood from your uh, from your talk that um, something has been left rather than physical something is left in the architecture in the Brazilian architecture or world architecture as well uh, so um, in brief how do you uh, how do you position this this uh, monuments, ephemeral monuments, in terms of the, the, the history of architecture or the, or the presence and the importance of the Brazilian architecture. Are they, um, are they summary, uh, a kind of a brief of the architecture that was practiced on those different times? Are they examples that open the field to something that may be uh, built and done afterwards? Or are they standalone pieces by itself? Um, let me start by the, the first, uh, uh, your first statement. Monument. Okay. I think the problem lies in. Uh, I think that there is a basic problem with the concept of monument, and you have this idea that uh, uh, modern architecture, or, or the uh, let's say the pioneers, were against monumentality. No, they were against grandiloquence, and, uh, and they were you know, against the type of monument that was epitomized in the uh, Roman monument to Vittorio Emanuele. Okay? Because if you go to the dictionary, and I, I always consult dictionaries, okay, you'll see that a monument is any kind of object intended to recall and celebrate an idea, institution, even person. So there is no reference about, you know, the durability of the monument. Uh, the essence of the monument is in the fact of its celebration, its commemoration. It's actually, the word monument etymologically has two interesting connections, which um, uh, are better expressed in Romance language than in English. 
Because in Asia, you say that a monument is something to remember and to commemorate, which is to remember with. If we were talking in Portuguese, I would say rememorar e comemorar, which would be, you know, the same uh, route. So this is the first thing. So my first point is that the ephemeral monuments is not an oxymoron. Okay? So it's really what, what is at stake is a, 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 a biased definition of monumentality that applies to certain kinds of monuments. Because when you say that something is a monument, you're using a descriptive word. It's not an evaluation. You have to be careful between uh, those two things are not exactly the same thing. So I guess, you know, this is my answer to your question, your, the first part of your question, and you know, as, um, well, the best thing I can do for now. And uh, uh, so uh, that's why I say that it's a machine for remembrance. Because if you go from this uh, sort of point, there a lot of things, you know, come to be associated with the idea of monumentality. Okay, the second part of your question is about, uh, about uh, the pavilions uh, and themselves. I would say that uh, they are, you, 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 the point is, you know, when you're uh, really important or, or really um, moving pieces of architecture, uh, they not only operate, they speak, but they speak in, in different levels, and then they can speak on those levels simultaneously. So, in, in a way, you can look at, uh, say, the New York Pavilion. The New York Pavilion uh, was uh, 39, you know, so modern, choosing, you know, modern architecture, when modern architecture was a minority affair, you know, in, you know, most of the practitioners in Brazil would at that time, you know, being you, your average historicist, the classicism doing all sorts uh, of styles, was in itself significant because it meant at that point in time, modern architecture was new and was really, you know, uh, one way of uh, showing uh, a glimpse of the world of tomorrow, which was the theme of the fur, and which actually was a very important uh, point uh, during the uh, judging of the design competition, which gave the first prize to Costa. Uh, so, but you can look back, you know, from our perspective, and uh, in our perspective, our perspective, we have, we have already passed through, you know, this phase of modern architecture. Well, modern architecture, when something becomes, uh, something becomes hegemonic, it also becomes vulgar, and it loses its aura. So we are going back to the, by, you know, having traveled, by having traversed, you know, understanding that uh, while it looked new at that point in time, it would not look new anymore in, in the 50s because modern architecture was everywhere. So you have this flow and ebb, this ebb and flow of uh, 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 symbolic meanings. But uh, I'd say that the really interesting works of architecture survive and they uh, still uh, might seem fresh, you know, after we're talking 1940, 1940 to, to 20, we're talking about 80 years old. You have this pavilion, this pavilion is 80 years old, and I would say in design terms, it, to me at least, you know, it looks fresh. It doesn't look, you know, outdated. It doesn't look, let's say, period, okay? And um, also, the other point of the story is that uh, there are changes, historical changes, but uh, we're still in the same cycle. That's the point I was, uh, I think that that's one of the remarks I was telling, that we, we have to be able 
to see things in different time levels. Okay. The, the, uh, this, I think, it's best summarized by uh, Charles Baudelaire, the French poet, definition of modernity, that uh, modernity has uh, one face that is fleeting, that is all transients, it is uh, of today, it's of the instant, but also modernity is of the eternal, of, it's, uh, of the things that do not change. So this paradox, this contrast, I think that uh, characterizes uh, good architecture. And uh, I would say that all of those four pavilions are very good works of architecture, even though, you know, I like some more than others. I don't know whether I answered your question. So when you say that uh, they are in the same cycle, you're referring to the five pavilions, uh, even though they are in done in such a different moment. They still yeah. trying to. They they uh, they are modern, you know, mm. because uh, in the uh, I'm using modern as kind of an encompassing descriptor in the same way as we use it, you know, classical to. Uh, talk about you know, architectures as different as High Renaissance, uh, Mannerism, uh, Baroque, Second Empire um, architecture. You know. So, and Albert. Uh, the Brussels Pavilion yeah. has this floating roof. With Rui, we saw, we visited Bra a building in Brasilia by the same architect that is already by almost, Bernardes. Yes, almost demolished. So also has the same concept. Ah, the uh, oh, and, uh, justice uh, pavilion. Of the, it was, yeah, it, you know, it is. Uh, I saw some pictures. It is already completely, yeah, almost not recuperated, <laughs> disfigured, <laughs> and then. Uh, we have Caesar Pavilion, in Lisbon Expo, which is, relates more with Brasilia than with Brussels. And I, I'm, I'm just a practical question. This is so unique in terms of uh, seldom see this kind of uh, floating mm. roofs. They are, this architect, which I like very much, the architecture, I don't remember the name. The, Bernardes. Bernardes. Did he did more this? Uh, yes, he more has. Uh, like this. No, yes. More buildings uh, like this. Yes, I, I think that uh, the 1950. I don't particularly like Brussels, you know, you know just no, between I prefer, you I and. I prefer the building of Brazil. Yeah, <laughs> between Brazil. you and me. I think that he had his idea. Yeah. I think that. Uh, I didn't mention it when talking, but. Uh, the first idea was to have four pylons. And then he had to add you know, the columns all, uh, all the way around. So, but he kept you know, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, strong you know, triangular emphasis at the corners, which I think you know, detract you know, a lot you know, of the, um, well, I can understand the gesture, you know, but uh, I don't think that it's well-rounded anyway. Okay. So, but the the fifty four uh, São Paulo pavilion seems to be elegant and small enough to be sustained by four points only, and then he has um, a very interesting um, pavilion in Rio. It's um, São Cristóvão. Yes, uh, it's uh, the São Cristóvão pavilion that was done for a, a kind of an exhibition and uh, had a kind of saddle roof. It was not a tent, but it was a saddle roof. Uh, sadly, uh, the covering is, the roof is gone. You know, you only uh, get the uh, oval form of the walls. You know. But uh, Bernardo was v very much, you know, trying to be original and different. And also, in, at, at that point, there was, in the 50s, uh, the uh, steel was uh, scarce for the construction industry in Brazil during the 40s. 
And uh, in the 50s, there was a hope that steel could uh, become more popular, uh, more available. You know? Which, by the way, is happening now. And the Dubai Pavilion is all steel. And most of the um, interesting work uh, in Sao Paulo right now is using steel. Actually, Mendes Arrocha used a lot of steel in his uh, last period, uh, from the 70s onward. Uh, thank you for your lecture. It was very interesting. Um, <clears throat> I think the the, um, the field of uh, designing pavilions in architecture is uh, like an experimental field where it's an opportunity to try something new. Uh, in a free way, because you have, uh, most of the times you have the, the free, uh, freedom to do what, whatever you, you can, can do or think. And uh, besides being, a, creating a space to expose some, something, uh, in terms of, uh, I see it as a experimental, opportunity to do something different and try something new. Do you consider that these cases at their own times, each one, were an experimental experience to try to do something different from what was done at the time? Well, uh, it depends. I, I don't think that I coincide with you. I don't think that uh, necessarily uh, a fair, uh, a fair building, a, an exhibition building, has to be new, or has to be innovative. No, no I, I respect your position, but it's not mine. <coughs> it's not mine. I do think that what you have to do is uh, being outstanding, and you can be outstanding. I think this is the example of Dubai. You can be outstanding by uh, choosing uh, a design that looks conservative, but that uh, contrasts and with the context, and by contrasting with the context, becomes original in that situation. So I don't think that... Uh, um, this is my position. I'm sorry if we don't uh, coincide. I don't think that you have to be original. I think that you have to be good, which is a different thing. I don't think that you have to try something. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, your, your contestation of originality, does it refer to your initial uh, uh, three points of contemporary dequincy that architecture always somehow relates to these archetypes? And In it's the archetypes that uh, create the, uh, our, our connection to the concept uh, of, uh, of the building and not necessarily the technological innovation or the a new expression uh, of the architecture? Well, uh, in part, Rui, because, you know, the, um, structurally, the, uh, the Brazilian pavilion to buy is not, you know, uh, coffee and milk, you know. It's, uh, uh, we're talking about four, you know, supports, and we're talking about a cube, which is not so, so small, after all. Okay, but the point is that the technology that is employed there, it doesn't show off in the same sense, for instance, as uh, in the same uh, in in Osaka in seventy, yeah. you know, as the inflatable dome that was um, 
proposed at the um, American Pavilion, and which, by the way, has more or less the same shape as in this San Cristobal Pavilion by Bernardes I was uh, uh, mentioning uh, before. You know, so uh, it's it, it's 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 a question of subtlety. It's not necessarily you don't really have to cry. I I think that. Uh, <laughs> Costa, Lucio Costa, uh, who wrote a lot, and, uh, and he had a way with words. Um, I, I mean, when he, when he says that modern architecture is this smart girl with no make, make, uh, makeup and uh, skinny legs, uh, I can visualize Maison Citroën, you know, immediately. You know, it, uh, it, it's a very... Uh, um, anthropomorphic, you know, um, description of uh, an architectural object. But uh, uh, anyway, um, I guess I'm, I, I have lost myself. You uh, were telling... I was just but, asking if your, uh, your opinion on uh, uh, the, yeah. the approach of the pavilion, was it uh, based on the fact that they are not necessarily about innovation has to do with Quarta Mary the Quincy's criteria. Yes, I was saying that uh, at the very least, I think that Quarta um, uh, Mary de Quincy's um, idea of the three archetypes is uh, a kind of, uh, well, he can't afford, he felt compelled to recognize by the uh, historical evidence at his time that the situation could not be re the architectural uh, field can, could not be reduced to the primitive hut of Logier. Mm. But uh, he also had uh, a kind of, uh, but he, he kept his um, prejudice in the sense that, okay, uh, I do recognize the three archetypes, but, but uh, in spite of that, in spite of these, you know, now we are to go uh, for the Greek temple, because the Greek temple is, you know, the uh, Western beacon. Now, now one interesting thing uh, about uh, uh, modern architecture is that, in a way, it's like uh, is like lightness mm. uh, superseded the massiveness that was tied with the classical tradition. So. I found that the three archetypes are still useful, you know, um, references. Yes. Okay. I think that uh, it still provide uh, uh, some anchors. Mm. And um, well, I I like that way of thinking, as, as you might have said. Uh, but you see, uh, we're talking about lightness. But Osaka is not light. Mm. Osaka is massive. And then, you know, the, uh, the, the, um, the Baudelaire thing uh, starts, to play in, uh, starts to play as well. In the 60s, and we're talking brutalism, you know, uh, our poet, we had, uh, we have, uh, we had you know, uh, perhaps the greatest modernist poet of Brazil was called Carlos Drummond de Andrade. And Carlos Drummond de Andrade has a connection with architecture, but he was the chief of staff of Minister Gustavo Capanima, who um, mm. built the, minis the ministry, uh, commissioned the ministry. And um, Drummond has a line in mid-50s, more or less this way, E como ficou chato ser moderno, agora serei eterno, which is more or less in English, uh, fed up with being modern, I want to be eternal. So in a way, you know, all this brutalist vogue is kind of playing with this, um, with this uh, ambiguity of uh, modernity that uh, I think Baudelaire describes so well. The fact that uh, you go to the archetypes, you go to the origins, you know, but uh, uh, you understand that things change, but um, 
you also have this feeling that things stay, or at least you want to build a human world uh, that outlasts uh, our life, uh, our lives, uh, our lives as individuals. So. I see. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to extend this uh, uh, dissertation. <laughs> dissertation. Spirits of the place, and when you do architecture, the history yeah. of the place, etc. So this ex this expo have the spirit of the time of a era. Yeah. So, so you have this. You select it. It's another could be another question. If you these four examples are the best compared with because you skip a lot of expo. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's related with this spirit. So, in these four times, it was maybe the. Yeah, but the I said, uh, come on, I selected four examples and, and I said, I selected four examples of, you know, uh, designs that their contemporaries had uh, voted for, you know, as deemed uh, as um, worthy. You know, of steam. So my comment is, yeah, is, is uh, giving value to, to yeah. your choice uh, in the sense that uh, another similar looking is when how you compare these pavilions with the other countries' pavilions, because there is a spirit of the time of, of the time in each of these four times. There was Brazilian pavilion. There was other countries, other architects, yes. trying to do all this work. Yeah. So how to compare? So how to compare them? So well, with, with the other proposals. Well, the the, um, the Brazilian of a, uh, the the uh, Brazilian the Brazilian pavilion uh, at the New York World Fair was a huge success. You know, in the specialized press, it, it it was first it was a surprise because you know a Latin American nation you know uh, being uh, at the forefront. Of modern architecture, that is uh, that was unexpected, and one way uh, that uh, the rich nations uh, reacted to these was by saying that uh, well, this pavilion was designed by disciples of Le Corbusier, which is a way of you know of uh, getting Bring back to Europe. Yeah, getting back to Europe. So, so there was um, uh, so the. the the pavilion was so successful that it was one uh, of the magnets for the um, 1942 um, exhibition at MoMA, Brazil Builds, uh, which actually made you know this uh, particular group of architects uh, well known around the globe at that point in time. Uh, Brussels. Um, it seems that Brussels was uh, interesting, uh, although uh, the architectural review uh, really uh, pointed out that uh, the structurally they, it, it was not as um, um, coherent you know, as uh, it wanted. Uh, Osaka was completely forgotten. Osaka didn't make news or headlines. Osaka uh, is making news and headlines now that Paulo Mendes da Rocha has died, you know, and but then, uh, well, uh, Osaka is making, um, is being the focus of interest now because, you know, Paulo Mendes da Rocha was recognized in 2006 with the Pritzker Prize and he is died, he is dead now, you know, so. Uh, his reputation is uh, growing internationally. Uh, there is a lot of interest, you know, in brutalist architecture, and this pavilion, I think, is particularly interesting. Even though, you know, the uh, exhibition designed, the original exhibition design would be much better than Did what has done. It's on Paul. Oh, yeah. But this really effect, like this effect of uh, Osaka Pavilion. Uh, do you think that is because the, the, the kind of architecture he did 
is so different from what was the trend of the rest of the Expo in the yes, rest of the world? Yes, 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 absolutely. And it was contradictory, you know. I, I think that in this case, you know, he selected, he selected reinforced concrete not only because, you know, he was able to do reinforced concrete, but also because he knew that uh, being reinforced concrete would really, he was pointing out uh, to the uh, uh, to to. It was contradictory with you know the trend. The trend of the time was all about you know three D uh, metal structures, prefabrication. Yeah, yeah, and so on and so forth. So so he was. It was an anomaly. Because if you can compare. You can compare. There's a parallel with with the concrete in Brazil, concrete in Spain. Yeah. And then you place what you know what. <laughs> in yes, it was. And it was. The and thing is that the sculpture museum is a perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's being a Jew, you know. Yeah. And. Uh, don't forget that uh, São Paulo has a huge um, uh, has a huge Japanese colony, and uh, uh, I think that that the sixties, from the sixties to the end of the twenties, uh, uh, from mid sixties to let's say the end of the nineties, Brazilian architecture was completely uh, ignored and um, even vilified by. Uh, the first word press, the specialized press. So it was, you know, the, the, it was with uh, when Doka Mama held uh, the conference in Brazil in 2000, there was a lot of surprise with the brutalist work, you know, in Sao Paulo. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember Mary MacLeod, uh, the professor at Columbia, telling him, how come that these, you know, uh, wasn't uh, was under our radar, you know. <laughs> yeah. 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 As for Dubai, just to end the, the, the question, Dubai really counted among the um, five most uh, visited pavilions of the fair. And um, I didn't visit Dubai myself, but uh, a close friend. Uh, who is uh, the editor? Who is the uh, editor of uh, uh, the Argentinian journal, architecture journal Suma, and who was a member of the jury, uh, was there, and I, I really trust his his opinion. And uh, he told me that uh, yeah, it, it was among, uh, in his opinion, uh, one of the really few moments uh, for architecture in that fair. He created space. He created the plaza. Yeah. Yeah. Going back to space time again. Yeah. <laughs> well, with okay. that, I wanted to wrap up our session. Thank uh, uh, Professor Comer for uh, uh, sharing with us this class, and also thank Tongji University for bringing you so <laughs> close to us. And uh, thank you all for coming today, and those uh, following us on Facebook as well. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you.